Nino, I'm going to just, I don't, I don't need to introduce you. Everybody knows who you are. We met at uh, the IACP conference. You're the very first person I saw when I walked in the hotel. You were standing there and I recognized you. And uh, mm -hmm. I, we, I came up and I think we kind of hit it off. We kind of became friends pretty quick, huh? Yeah, that's right. Uh, that, was a, that was such a nice lobby they got. It must have been the nicest dog training lobby <laughs> slash uh, conference room I've ever seen. I you know, know it, it was I great. Know. Yeah. And, they, and they, same they, for they me. I recognize you. Oh, you did? Yeah, okay, you know, I didn't it, know if you knew who I was. I always wonder if people are going to know who I am. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. It's very okay. recognizable. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, so yeah. are you. <laughs> so here I am <laughs> oh, in my very dark studio in California, and you're in Belgium mm -hmm. now, right? Yes, that's right. You're, you're up Belgium, so I'm sunny house. nine hours Belgium? ahead of you. So you have 12 o'clock now, right? Oh, no, 9 o'clock. I have 12 o'clock. Night. Yes, 9, At 9 p.m. That's right. So one thing I think is really interesting, and I think this is a really, because I think we probably have similar audiences, you know, probably, you know, I think the internet world is kind of small. I think, you know, I mean, so many people that I talk to online, I've had conversations with, you know, different people, Tom Davis, uh, uh, Will Atherton, uh, I mean, all these different people. Um, it's a small world. The one thing I think I really want to talk to you about is this idea of balanced training, right? I mean, we see so much of it, we see so much content, first of all, and I think there's so much good content on the internet. You're among you know, the good guys out there um, who are providing really good information for people who really wanna learn how to train their dog and be better dog trainers. And I think that's something really important. Um, there's a lot of people who give basic information, you know, oh, how to get your dog to walk on a loose leash. There's a lot of that going around. But I think your content kind of goes to the next level. You know, you're doing a lot with Malinois, you're doing um, other things, but I, I'm not sure that's an interesting topic for us to talk about. You know, I think people are really interested in things that are game changers. And I think one of those game changers is you teach both balance training and you do positive only, right? Robert, Yeah, I understand. I understand your question, but actually, we already have to disagree a little bit here because okay. what you refer to now is as in there's people that train with rewards and there's people that train with tools and you know and then you have both opposite sides actually i don't care less if you train with tools or you train without tools i like i've seen people with tools that that suck that can't use tools i've seen people without tools that suck so both sides have you know pros contrasts so I'm not so much interested in in the tools itself. To me, it's you know it's been a, a process of understanding how I got to a certain point in in like you know a very small period of time. So I I had an I think it was 13 years ago. I posted a video on Facebook, and that video got 48,000 shares, which was a lot back in the shares. day. It was huge. Yeah, shares, wow. shares. Wow. So back then they didn't even track views. You could not even see how many views. But given the fact it was 48,000 shares, that's got to be millions, right? So, and I was surprised. I was surprised, like, why does everybody want, like, to me, it was just another day, you know, in the office, uh, sort of speaking. Mm -hmm. My dog was doing left, right, movements, but very crisp, very on point, fast, precise. To me, it was the norm, but apparently it was not for most people. And I, th I don't think I ever had a question at that point, because I would have done with a collar, without a collar. I didn't even pay attention to it. But for me to then, you know, becoming a coach slash teacher, you know, so, uh, a speaker, I had to backtrack and see, okay, how did I get that success? Where does that come from? What are, how, how was I able to make my dog look so good, even though I had no experience, I had no previous knowledge of training, I had nobody that I knew that was, you know, uh, affiliated with professional dog training back in the day, besides, you know, somebody that I was training with in the club. But I was just, you know, for me to go out and then teach about what made me successful, it wasn't about tools. The first thing that came to mind is like, what were these mechanics? Mm -hmm. What was move? What were the moving parts? What was making a difference? What were my priorities in my training set? Uh, what made my dog be so fast and so energetic? And mm -hmm. and how was I able to flow and synchronize with the, with this dog? You see, those terms are what you know stuck to me and related to me as. Okay, well, Nino is known for a certain style, a certain type of movement. And of course, you know, along the, the way, when I started posting more videos, people started asking, do you use tools? Have you used a marker? So then they were asking questions. And I know why they ask them. People want answers 
to comprehend, to understand how a result was was created. Mm -hmm. And by giving them, you know, an answer to it was this tool and it was this marker and it was this type of ball and it was this kind of jack and it was this kind of food. <laughs> it's what they ask you the whole time. I'm sure, sure they ask you too, Robert, like what sure. food do you use? What color right. do you use? Because people want the tangibles, mm -hmm. you know, but I see what I see is in order to have a performance, you're looking at so many subconscious skills that go into this that we almost as speakers also forget to mention them because mm -hmm. it's in your subconscious. If you're working dogs and you've done it for such a long time and for you, it's it's very normal what you do. For some people they go, wow, he's got, he's got I gotta pick this guy's brain. I gotta understand everything he uses, why he does this. And this is a great question, why you do stuff. But I think there's a lot of emphasis on tools and markers and positive versus negative. And I was never a part of that game. I've been an advocate for using tools at the police uh, where I was an instructor, police canine handling for years. You know, a long time I was at the committee who decided if you could use tools and ban tools like e-collars, for example, for police uh, instructors and canine handlers. And it was, it always stuck to me as what kind of a, you know, debate it was. It was always about, you know, should I use it? Should we not use it? It was never anything discussed about true skill, a combination of skills, mm -hmm. this, this competency you have to create. And is it talent or is it a competency? Like uh, what kind of uh, control mechanisms you operate on, like all this stuff that has such a huge influence on how you work with dogs and how you get results. It was never discussed. So, you know, for you to come and to ask me, you know, first off the bat tools or balanced versus uh, positive, I, you know, I have opinions of course, but I wouldn't say that, that would define me because I have done phenomenal things with puppies. I believe, you know, the way they've moved and the way they've, you know, showed, and I've done things with tools also where people go, it's because of the tool. Right. So I think both worlds, you know, have their right to exist. And I actually love both. I have right. a, a positive trainer that I support it. We have a positive only class on my platform. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love this stuff. And I, I do a lot of it myself. And But I also use tools. And I've never said I didn't. So, yeah. Well, no, I think that's exactly, that's exactly where I'm going with this. I, I think somebody like you or me, you know, and, and many other good, really good trainers, it's not about the tools, right? It doesn't matter. Okay, so for example, I worked at the shelter, you can't use a prong collar. Okay, I use a slip lead and I use cookies, you know, that's fine. We can do that. Um, I, I think it's an interesting topic. You said something really interesting at dinner um, one night. You said, these people come and they watch you, they watch me, they watch the next guy, they watch this guy, and then they go home and they're really <laughs> not gonna apply any of it, right? They're just going to go back to their same old That's thing. Right. It's, it's, do, do you think that in training, that when people want to be a trainer, that sometimes they absorb too much information? Or is there such a thing? Yeah, for sure. Oh, absolutely, there's such a thing as absorbing too much information. And also the order the information is given. Look, mm -hmm. there's people are going heavily on the cognitive skill, which is they will teach you about signs, they will teach you about skin or about Pavlov, you know, all these things, right? So your cognitive skill is through the roof. And then you go out there and you apply zero. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things. And then, you know, you go to a conference where there's multiple speakers, but everybody has their own style. Everybody has their own unique ways of combining these skills. And it's hard for people to see, you know, what they should be attracted to. If, because if you're looking at results, let's say they put Robert next to Nino and they'll go, okay, I see uh, Robert's dog's very responsive and, and he's very clean and, well, looks great. Okay, we see Nino. Well, it also looks good. So what do we choose? Like, they don't know because, mm -hmm. you know, for pros like us, we can look at details. We can look at, you know, energy. We can look at so many things where we would go make an assessment and say, look, maybe this is the style you lean towards, you know, based on what you want, based on what you want to acquire, based on the sport competition, whatever you're in, based on the breed, so many variables, so many uh, parameters you can look into. But for, you know, the common people that started dog training, which were a lot of professionals, new professionals, mm -hmm. well, I mean, what, what is this? Like you, you have 10, 20, 30 people coming in and they all have a different style. They all have a different opinion. All, I mean, how are you supposed to walk out and know, okay, this is where I'm going to go to. You yeah. only get 90 minutes. So yeah. I think it, it's these initiatives are a great initiative, I think, for professionals. Mm -hmm. But too much might be sometimes too much. So, you know, how, yeah. How do you process all this stuff? Look, and, and back back to what we said, you go out on the pitch, you're not going to remember any of these people. Mm -hmm. What you need is a blueprint. What you need is, you know, a, a process that's stuck with you where you understand 
what your part is, what skill exactly you're going to apply, this conscious application of the skill at hand, which you need for that specific task process. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what matters and nothing yeah. else. Not who spoke at the conference, not you know what theory belongs to who. Yeah. Nobody's able to process that in the moment where a dog reacts really fast. He does things unexpected the whole time. You, you can't cope with this. So mm -hmm. it has to be in your hands. It's got to be in your feet, literally. And you have to start living the moment more than think about the moment that's about to happen. Yeah. Because I've seen it so many times, very, very knowledgeable people. But when the heat's on, and with the heat's on, I mean, the dog's ready to work. He's coming out the blocks. And for me, coming out the blocks means full energy. <laughs> right. Usually, the dog outworks them a lot. Mm -hmm. So the dog's a little bit too fast. They can't see the mistakes. They can't process, you know, they can't analyze what went wrong. They have to readjust. They don't have the skill maybe to readjust. So there's so many things going on. And then the sweat literally drops from their head. <laughs> and, at the, and at the end of the session, they don't really know what went on. And then, yeah. of course, you know, the good thing is about dog training that the more repetitions you put in, the, the more strength the dog gains in understanding it, even if you've done it, if you're not under, completely understood yourself, the dog does a good job in understanding kind of what you want from this, you know, and that's just the thing. Yeah. So in the end, then all systems work because the dog's going to get it somehow. You could do things mm -hmm. completely opposite as what science tells you and still mm -hmm. get results. That's a, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. So do you think trainers oftentimes, especially, you know, you, you, you have a very big online platform. I have a very big online platform. Do you think that, because I, I have a gut feeling on this, do you think trainers make it too complicated for people? Like, like oh, this, this scientific term and this scientific term and this R plus R minus right quadrant, left quadrant, th that it's yeah. overwhelming for people? Like, I don't know. I, I get lost in all those things personally. Yeah, I feel they, they're looking for answers to validate what they do. And they're looking for these answers within science. And science has done great things. I'm the last guy to say that science does not mean anything. But you got to look at it this way. If you're coming home with that new puppy, or if you just got a dog from the shelter, both huge challenges. Do we agree that, you know, both, these, this is going to be something, right? Your, your life's going to change. It's going to have yep. an impact. Yep. So you're not going to be thinking of all the science. That's impossible. Especially where you, you're going to put things in the equation. You go out like, when it starts to get very theoretical, you lose people, yep. right? But what really matters is like, what are these hands going to do to you? What, what difference can you make day one? And usually the, the biggest difference is what choice do you make? What do you prioritize? And what do you envision this dog to be? And then what would you believe the pathway to this vision is based on the skills that you currently have or the ones you need to develop? Mm -hmm. And then your process will look you, you will either do things even without the dog, maybe some of the things with the dog. So it needs to be really, uh, you know, well thought over because else it becomes such a, what, such a mess, really, because the dog gets involved right away. You're involved right away. So many things going on. And look, nobody has time to think about theory. Nobody does that. It's always their subconscious. I say cognitive skills help a lot once you have some mechanical, you know, basis to, to fall back on. And then, you know, you can read into all this stuff and it will make sense to you. I, mm -hmm. I truly think it does. But to use that as a cliffhanger to sell your system or methodology or to back it up, I've never been a big believer of it. And I'll tell you why, uh, Robert, because when I had the 48,000 shares, I never read anything about science. Mm -hmm. And I had a result that people did not understand how I did it. And I had to backtrack myself like, yeah, well, I came from a non-traditional way of coming into dog training as, you know, I, I didn't look at it as, oh, this is what I do first. I read a book first. I, I read about science first. I didn't do any of that. I just went in and my angle was movement as a former track and field uh, runner, or I would say um, practitioner, mm -hmm. because a runner, you got to run really fast to call yourself a runner. Yeah. <laughs> so that didn't always happen. Right. But I was, I was very big on the movement. I understood, look, if I analyze what an athlete needs to do to be really good at what he does, it's about mechanics, it's a physiology, mm -hmm. it's you know all these components, it's so many things. And I looked at dog training, and it's like, I wonder if these people consciously move the way they do, or is just right. all coincidental. Is it all the dog? Like I had to I had to figure this out. So I came in from a different angle. So for me, the mechanics, the movement, the physiology, what you could do to make a difference, the way you move, the way your angles look. I I think I I understood pretty soon that this was gonna make a substantial difference. I mean, that's just one of the parts that, mm -hmm. you know, led to the 
the whole methodology that I got in my head. So, yeah, I think that was re really interesting because we talked about that and we both came from a very non-traditional. I came from martial arts. You came from track and field. And I, mm -hmm. I, I knew nothing about dog training. I went to the shelter and I was working with dogs and it worked <laughs> and I was able to help. And that's what I think attracted, you know, our, us to each other, our friendship, because um, it's it's really not, you know, the scientific thing, the people I find that talk a lot about the science are people who lecture too much and don't do much practical application. And also people who are always criticizing, right? People who get online and are going to put you down for this or put you down for that. And then they're going to quote scientific things, Skinner things, Pavlov things, you know, and all these other um, scientific terms. And in the meantime, they're not really training dogs. And that's always been my pet peeve where yep. the science gets in the way of the actual training. I, I have no problem with science. I, I like it. I'm, I'm not good at it, by the way. I don't know much about it. But I certainly do know what makes the dog tick, and as do you. You know, your stuff is very dynamic, very, very, you know, it, you know, powerful and stuff like that. And I think that's, it's fun. That's, I think, the biggest part of it. I think that you, you make the training look like fun. And I think... The most important thing, and this is something that I talked to Vadim uh, about, who's the head of the um, IGP, the Schutz in the USA, they're really bringing this into IGP, not into AKC yet, I wish they would, but they want to see how the dog works. Like when I see your dogs working with you, they are happy, right? They're mm -hmm. happy to be doing the job. My dog, Goofy, almost 13 years old, he's happy to be doing whatever he's doing. So. I don't think the methodology matters as much. Did you use a cookie? Did you use a prong collar? Did you use a slip lead? Um, and again, what kind of cookie did you use? But getting those dogs to be happy and dynamic and connected is something that I strive for, you know, it, to help people understand better. And is, is that along your line of thinking yeah. too? Yeah, so what you refer to in my vocabulary, because we all have our thoughts, mm -hmm. and I would call that energy master. So what you see, when we refer to happy dogs, I what I see is, is we, can't, we can't ask them, are you truly happy? Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know. So we can base ourselves on these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, you know, we can only base ourselves on these, you know, subjective uh, things like, you know, is his tail wagon? Is he... Is his, are his ears up or, you know, is, does he want more? Does he feel like, you know, he's energized? And mm -hmm. that's what I say, energy master. So if you can amp up that energy and you can exchange it, and that's something that's never been talked about. Like, you know, mm -hmm. science does not talk about energy exchange between master and dog. They're not dog trainers. Let's not forget Pavlov nor Skinner were dog trainers, okay? Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's hard to see them as, you know, the examples of, you know, how you should be looking into dog training because, you know, they don't great work in, in researching some behaviors, but they were not dog trainers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and what you refer to is, I see, you know, a happy dog, that to me means high energy. Yeah. So the question is, how do I get that high energy? Now, if we ask the question, how do we get that energy? That means, well, then what do you use, right? So now we go again to, is it a cookie? Is it a ball? Is it, but that's the thing. Yes, there is going to be rewards involved in this process. There is going to be movement involved. There is going to be a setup involved where you manipulate the predator because I call it manipulation. It's a predator. If, if you would leave it on its own, it usually chooses its own direction, its own prey. It's, it has its own peace of mind. Like it doesn't follow you by nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we manipulate. So there's so many things here that go on. And the question then is then how good are you in assessing what the dog is, you know, willing to do? What's his instinct based on? How do you work that instinct? And how you manipulate him by something that he wants, that source? How do you create more attraction to that source? So if you start looking into it deeper, it's really a game of energy. Like, okay, if that ball gives an X amount of energy, what would a moving ball do? But if I use a moving ball, how much control do I still have over him? Do I then need mm -hmm. to use corrections or do I need to use tools or leashes or whatever? So it's this continuous process where you have to make decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. But that's, we go back to the beginning. You know, are you qualified to make those decisions yet? Because I, I love to see people work the ball, but I always think it's too soon. You're not qualified yet. And by not qualified, I mean, you don't know even how to amp up the energy and drive, but now you want to use the ball as an obedience tool and you're going against the dog's instinct because the dog wants, I want it now. I want it now and I want it fast. Mm -hmm. But he can't have it now and fast because it's a delayed 
reward if you want to do obedience with the ball. Mm -hmm. So here's where the trouble starts coming in. Then what is your what is your process? What what is the way you're going to approach this? Do you understand now what skills are going to come into play? Because if you're going to use a ball, you will need a tool because you kind of have to stop the dog from getting the ball right away. Okay, then how do you use this tool? How do you how do you hold a leash then? What do you do with the leash? What kind of subtle technique is involved? And again, it's, then it becomes crafts work again. What do these hands do? How much intuition do you have? How much imagination do you have on what can possibly happen before it happens? And it's it's this kind of stuff that's also never discussed. You know, yeah. have you looked into the brain of a world champion? You've interviewed world champions, but you, you can talk about their successes and, and what they do and stuff like that. But have you really done a profiling? A profiling is psychological profiling. You know, how they operate. You know, how they subconsciously add up all these skills. That's the thing. We don't because we look at the dog's result and we, you know, we have a tendency to forget how complex this process can be from a handler's view, but because it's in the subconscious, it's hard to start talking about it. So mm -hmm. then again, we refer to simple things as food and ball and, 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 you know, and, and, and tools and a send away and, and, oh yeah, we put a ball in the back and then the dog goes, in. this is the, the stuff we can easily understand, mm -hmm. but the psychology stuff is, is way harder. And that needs, I mean, that's a cognitive skill that I find yeah. very interesting, maybe even more interesting than coming in, you know, with the science stuff about Skinner and Pavlov right away. Sure. Because talent development is, um, is also science because talent means your combination of skills that you can simultaneously apply and access. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you do that? And what can stop you? And what behavioral patterns are there that can, you know, hinder you from developing? It's really important to understand this, I think, even more than what operant conditioning means, you for know, you example. Said some, you said something interesting, though. You said, when I said a happy dog, you said a dog that's high in energy. But on a flip side of that, you have to look at high energy isn't necessarily happy. High energy can be frustrated. You know, um, when I see a mm -hmm. dog that's happy, it is high energy, um, but it's also a connection between the handler and the dog. And I think that's not talked about a lot in... You know, right. whether it's online training or in-person training, I think that's one of the most important dynamics is how, are you connected to that dog? Do you get, because I've worked with dogs that you know, I couldn't connect to, you know, there's certain dogs that you just, you can't, not everybody can connect to every animal, but that connection is so important, right? Yeah, I, th I think there's a beautiful English word that I love it, to describe it. It's called a symbiosis. Is that mm -hmm. correct, Liz? Symbiosis, yeah, absolutely. Yes. It's a great word. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's where that, you know, unnatural because we're two different species yeah. and we start interacting and you could feel like you could feel the dog's happy, even though you can't, mm -hmm. you can ask it, like you said, but you, yeah. you're never going to get an answer, right. but it's that connection that tells you yeah. this dog is legitimately content with what he does. I could, you could yeah. just feel it and he, nobody it. can tell you differently. Yeah, that's right. So right. he's, he's coming in, volu he's volunteering himself. Like I want to be in this game. Yeah. I did enjoy it. Even you yeah. told me to stop it, but I'm going to come back. And yes, you're right. I think it's a very good um, remark you made on, well, how much is that frustration of not getting something? He wants to obtain something. So he goes in high energy frustration because he wants to obtain it. So is that will to obtain it, maybe also a little bit of a stress level to him. And that's why he's amped up. Legit questions, something we have to think about. Because yeah, a working dog, if, if you look at, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go finish what you said about the working dog. Yeah, I think the working dog is, is such a, you know, difference between, you know, having a house dog and a working dog, which is supposed to perform. That's the definition of working dog. Like you tell him something that's, that belongs to his purpose and he has to do it. Yeah. And I, I think there there is a level of stress involved because just the fact he has to perform, else it's not a working dog. You can't show up at your trial and then say, all right, you ready? And dog's <laughs> just like, no, nah, I'm just going to go back to the car. <laughs> right. There's something right. like, there's a duty to complete. There's like, a, if you're at the police, like I have done so many years, you take the dog out of the car. I mean, this is like, it's a no brainer. You got to do right. this, right? Yeah. So there's always a, a level of, um, of stress involved, you know, anyways, so. Yeah, I think that connection, I think a lot of people who get in, they see you, they see me, they see Rocky, they see Goofy, and they're like, oh, I want to do that. And then they go buy a Malinois, and then they sign up for your course, my course, whatever. And then they end up, either one of two things, or it's one of several things. Either they become very successful and become very good, which I think is the least of it. Um, they 
do the course and then stop halfway through and go, it's just too much, you know, or they just get really frustrated and then just go to another course, another course and another course, because it's, you know, you make it look very easy. I mean, I, I, I aspire to make it look easy and attainable, but is it really, is it really, is it really that attainable? Well, it's a, this is a big question you're asking because immediately when you said people go to this course, to that course, to that course, it is related to subconscious driver behavior. Mm -hmm. So I'll explain that to you. Somebody that has taken responsibility or wants to be accountable for having a certain result with a dog, even though he, he maybe he discussed it with his family. Anyways, he made a decision to do this, right? Mm -hmm. And he's not getting the result. But because he took responsibility, he will do anything it takes to ensure that he can come up with some kind of result. If that means looking at 10 methodologies, he will. If right. that driver, for example, is what we call a hurry up. And a hurry up will do multiple tasks at the same time to ensure that he gets a result. And the result right. is sacred. So they will get into multiple methodologies. Does that, and this is the behavioral pattern I was talking about. Is that the right way to go? No but it's subconscious driver behavior. And let's get a little bit deeper into driver behavior, what that means exactly. But specifically here, this is a case that is not so uncommon because the, what you mentioned happens a lot. So it's mm -hmm. not a coincidence. So where does that come from? You see, and that's where you can link this to driver behavior because people that do multiple things that can process multiple techniques of many people, it demands a certain type of person. The be perfect, for example, driver main, uh, main driver be perfect will never do this because he wants to be in control of the process. He wants to be in control. And when he is doing multiple things at the same time, he can't be. There will be chaos in his head. That's not going to serve him. So when the driver is under pressure, so in this case, when the result cannot be guaranteed, see, that's when the driver becomes to become act, starts to become active. He will start looking, okay, maybe I got to look at this guy. Maybe I got to look at this. Maybe I'm missing something here. So he starts, you know, and he does that subconsciously because he thinks that will ensure that result because I've done everything I could and I can process all this stuff and something will work out. Mm -hmm. It's just, these are some of these subconscious uh, behavioral patterns, mm -hmm. what I talked about. And, and like every driver, there's five main drivers. Once everybody has a main driver and I'll tell you where it comes from, but when it becomes activated, basically you no longer have control over these patterns you're falling into. And one of those drivers, the five main are be perfect hurry up, please others, be strong and try hard. So if we, well, I, I'm a, I'm a combination. So you have one main okay. driver and uh -huh. you have one, yeah. And you have one secondary. Um, it's a very private question because if you take these tests, basically you need somebody's permission to share that because oh, okay. it gives you as a, as a psychologist, we get a lot of insights basically in the NASA in 7075, every astronaut in there, they, they did a complete analysis on their driver because in the oh. most, I mean, in the most severe conditions as being in a space shuttle <laughs> locked up with, with geniuses, I mean, let's face it, these people are geniuses. They yeah. have to do the most complex stuff. You don't want their behavioral patterns showing when they right. get stressed. <laughs> and the first thing that goes out the door when your driver is activated are newly learned complex skills. Very important to know. So, but anyways, I can, I can share my driver. Mine is uh, be strong. It's my main driver. So be strong is about taking responsibility, guaranteeing a result. That's why also a lot of people clash with other people, right. not because they dislike the people, but let's say your main driver is be perfect. I already mentioned be perfect. Okay. And you want to control the process. You are under stress and you want to make sure, you know, if you do this this way, it's going to work because I've done it so many times, right? You have your, your uh, track record. You know, that is a process you want to, but I'm not interested in the process. I want to come with the result, and I will do whatever it takes and I will just dismiss your process and I will skip beats and I, and you no longer have control over this process. It's going to drive you crazy. This is all hypo hypothetically. I don't know if it'll be perfect, but that's what they call a clash of drivers. Do you want to be in a space shuttle where you are getting a clash of drivers between two very competent, very talented men or women? You don't want that. So. Now, the question is then, how can you anticipate on this driver getting activated? Because when it activates, you no longer have access to all your skills. Mm -hmm. That means by definition, you will come, you will be less talented as you were right. before. Right. And okay. that's something you have to avoid. So again, related to dog training, 
what is that probably going to do to you? So the be strong has a tendency, well, I'm going to ensure this result. So if I need to use a tool, and this is just all hypothetically, if I need to use a tool, I will, because that will you know, ensure that I can get this result, mm -hmm. driver behavior. Now let's go back a little bit where all this comes from, driver behavior. Like, can you choose your driver, right? And maybe I want to be perfect. Maybe I want to be try hard, but that's the thing you can't. As a, as a young child, between the age of three and 12, you know, 13, you do subconscious things with your parents the whole time, only for one thing, which is you want a connection with your parents. You want to be safe and you want to be loved. This is not something you choose. This is mm -hmm. by instinct. This is the way we are programmed. Survival. Yeah. So you will do subconscious thing. Yeah. Subconscious things that favor you to, to get this love or this, this safety. Now, these things specifically that you do are related to drivers. So for example, that just a complete example out of the blue, your kid comes home and they come out with a report and they say, look, mommy, I got a report from school. Oh, let me see. Oh, you got some B's and you got an A. Okay, great. How come you got that B? And, and no, no bad intentions. You just ask, how come you got the B? And you, your kid gives an explanation to it. They might think, look, it look, didn't seem so happy. Maybe if I got a straight A, they would love me more. This is subconscious thinking. This is not, they just go, what if I do this, right? And this, mm -hmm. or they do it and it works. All of a sudden, you are now creating a driver, which leads to, be. I got to be perfect. I got to make sure that I control this process. I got to come with a perfect result. I have to, you see, on the other hand, for example, you could have a kid be strong, take responsibilities. If I complete this task, mom and dad will be happy. If I ensure I can get with this result, mom and dad will be happy. After they told me to do this, so I'm not going to do anything else before I do this. You see? So subconsciously, you do stuff which works. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not something that just goes away. We all agree that in your childhood, that's when everything's sure. being built. Yeah. So, and that's so strong that this main driver, as soon as you're stressed, it's going to relate to what used to work for you. So you're going to show behavioral patterns that work for you. Now, within the uh, equation of then uh, working dogs, you're going to show certain behavior when you work the dog related to the driver. It's inevitable. It's not like you can choose it. It's inevitable. Right. Some people that try hard, they will do anything to impress the significant other. So that could be their coach, could be their mom, could be their dad, could be their sister, could be their kid, could be anyone they want to impress. And of course, they will do things then to ensure that they can do this. It's what we call their two extrovert drivers. It's a try hard. It's related to people mm -hmm. and to please others. So, and these two are very prone to have, you know, um, depressions and burnouts because when it's human related, it's, it's, it's more of a risk to get burnouts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's not very uncommon when you see people at a club, very, very, very unhappy this is, and stress, <laughs> yeah. literally, literally depressed. Mm -hmm. How come some of these people are please others. Mm -hmm. So, they don't have a choice when that driver gets activated what matters the most is they want to have the connection control over the connection with the other person they cannot live in a environment where there's uh, beefs going on or st so they will do things that don't agree with right. yeah so if they're going to do things with their dogs they don't agree with yeah. just because they want to maintain the connection mm -hmm. so now you see now we're not even talking doctoring anymore not even techniques methodologies food ball Mm -hmm. This is pure human psychology yeah. that plays such a big role in your choices you're going to make mm -hmm. and how you will have access to the skills that you've learned. And, you know, dismissing that, I think, is, is something that takes us back to, well, then I guess we're just going to focus on what ball and what stuff to use, right? And what jacket mm -hmm. to wear and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> because there's nothing else to think of. Sure. I think dog trainers, dog consultants, dog experts have reached out way too less to external consultants, which are experts in other areas to help us coach. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, when I was a police instructor and that was a, that was a pretty long class or how do you call it? Like a program you had to take. It wasn't like I just got this with a bag of chips. You really had to do a lot of effort, but mm -hmm. the amount of psychology coaching skills were none to zero. You, you are a designated coach as a police instructor. So sure. once you have the certificate, it's like you're now designated to teach X, Y, Z. You're going to do it now. You're their coach. And it doesn't work like that. Being accepted as a coach is a process. And we can talk about this is a different topic, of course, but it's not something you can do overnight. That's why designated coaches like this 
are not likely to have a lot of success in this environment. You see, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it's a natural process. If I accept you as a coach, Robert, that means you will have an impact on my life. Before I allow you to have an impact on my life, I need to, you know, go through a few steps. And mm -hmm. I, you ca I can't just be designated and then assume that, well, I'm your coach. Right. That's, that just doesn't work. The, the soonest thing that can happen, as, as, as soon as we disagree or I think you, I doubt your expertise and we don't have this uh, coach relationship established, mm -hmm. I would go, well, he's full of shit anyways. I, right. I don't buy what he says. I don't agree with what he says. I don't care. I think I was right from the start. He didn't look all that smart anyway. You see, you'll find so many reasons for you to believe I wasn't going to be my coach anyway. Mm. So, and all the, this is also one of these things. People call themselves coach right away. Like yeah. you, you, you have, this is something you have to earn. And this is, and once you establish a coach relationship, it could go really deep because the coach understands the B level of a person. Yeah. They understand from the inside, all, the, all these other stuff, all these other things outside of his dog training expertise that play an important role in their personal development. See, you, now it's not about dog training. But you're right. And I think it is really about psychology and human psychology. People always talk about dog psychology, dog psychology, where yeah. understanding those, those moving parts of why a certain kind of person can handle a certain kind of dog or why a certain kind of person can handle a certain situation better. And it's not, it really has little to do with men, woman, you know, big, tall, you know, strong, not strong. I think it has to do with the psychological strength, this, this inner key or strength or power, whatever you want to call it. Um, and also a lot of, you know, criticism is out there. Like, I, you know, that's one of the things you see that, like what you said, you know, we disagree and then suddenly it's like, well, that guy's no good anyway. You know, I never really believed in him or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know a lot of dog trainers, people always say, you know, the only thing two dog trainers can agree on if the third one's wrong. And I don't see it that way. I mean, I know a lot of dog trainers, you know, and I think, um, I respect a lot of dog trainers. I watch you. I respect what you're doing. I watch somebody like, you know, Frank Phillips or Peter and Connie Sherrick. I watch them and I think, wow, these guys are really good. And there's, there's, there's a component to that where it's not about my way is the only way. You know, my real goal was when I got into this, it was never to make money. It was just to help people with their dogs. And then I started making money. I said, oh, I can make money and help people. So it kind of worked hand in hand. But there's a lot of egos that go into this game where people get really offended easily or, or disappointed easily. And, yeah. you know, do you see that with your, you know, where you are and the people you coach as well? All, all the time. Very, very common. What you say is, is especially to the dog training industry. And I think it's a, to me, it shows a lack of true confidence. You know, if if you're like, if your ego is shattered just by somebody critiquing or whatever, or right. getting comments on a video, that means you, you maybe you feel insecure about it, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, in this game, to see somebody else successful, I mean, somebody who's very successful, and this has nothing to do with dog training, they're always happy when somebody else becomes successful. Yeah. It's usually the other way. When somebody mm -hmm. is not successful, and then they see somebody yeah. thriving or, or you know making a class making a good course making a nice video and they feel this hatred almost they're they they can't stop it they have to come you, you like could you imagine like spending private time which you could have done something else on hating on you know somebody you know what that does it's very yeah. unhealthy but people do it all the time all over the internet i think you're exposed to it as soon as you go on the internet you're going to face with oh man this is full of crap well, why are you doing this don't listen to this guy i just had a youtube comment like no you know never never buy a single class online it's all free you can find anything <laughs> online <laughs> see it's yeah. all, all these people you know mm -hmm. and i think usually when you know we, we come into this world of protection work tough dogs right you know there's always ego involved but I'm always surprised how easily these egos get shared just by having a dog that not that doesn't perform or underperforms. Mm -hmm. They get mad, they get frustrated, they get angry. So much anger in this world, you know. When it comes to dog training, it's it, that has struck me the most. It's one of the reasons that at some point I'm like, maybe this is not so fun anymore. Mm -hmm. Really, like, why are they always, you know, amped up about anything? You know, I remember making a huge mistake once. I like to share this because we have to learn from mistakes. Mm -hmm. I'm against choking a dog out. I've been very transparent about it. I don't like it. 
of my reasons. So it's a different topic, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody asked me like, what do you mean exactly? Like, and I, I showed a video and I made a big mistake of showing a video where there's somebody like displayed in the video. So of course they're gonna <laughs> feel addressed, right? Even right. though it had nothing to do with using them specifically. Right. Yeah, and that just, you know, the whole hate show began began, and like, I, it was like, almost like I was attacking this guy, but it, I wasn't because I know so many people that do this. Like we, mm -hmm. we're in Europe here. I mean, right. know so many people that I could use anyone, but I just sure. took the first thing off YouTube. And and the amount of hate, like just truly people coming out the woodwork to express yeah. their beliefs, because if people have the same core beliefs, they become allies, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a core belief that choking a dog out is definitely amping up his drive, is helping you, is that's a core belief. And if somebody goes out there and says, hey, guys, that might not be the best way to go, it's they become the Hulk. Right. They, it becomes nasty, nasty. So I was like, okay, this is not fun anymore. This is right. not about, this is now about egos. This is now yeah. about somebody believing that I'm trying to put them down, even though I wasn't. Right. But because I don't agree with it this certain way, that all of the, all of what they do is is, is like, crap that's mm -hmm. not what i said it's not what i mean but you see that's i think it's a good example of how egos are bruised easily and then the thing is was it wasn't you know once this person started to get involved it wasn't about you know the, the technique anymore it was about uh decoying is about you can't do this or you can't do that <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> yeah yeah like really okay 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 so you know it was one of the my my mistakes that i did is like okay that I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have right. put somebody on this video because then, of course, they would feel addressed. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I learned so much from it. And I think a dog training is always learning from mistakes. Sure. In this case, it wasn't like a dog training related, like on, in the action, but it's one of those things. And and this uh, industry is full of, you know, nasty stuff. You know, we yeah. and I, it starts with what you mentioned in the beginning, positive versus tool use. Ooh, mm -hmm. cool. It starts right there. But I mean, and I do think, for example, like I said, I spent 10 years in the shelters and every single, the only time I ever used an e-collar prong collar in the shelter was to demonstrate on either my dog or on me or a person how it works. I never put an e-collar or a prong collar on a shelter dog to teach anything because I couldn't do it. I would, my hands were tied. And that's by animal rights people, you know, I call them nutcases because I think they take it to the extreme. But in my private life with my dogs and dogs I train for clients, I enjoy, you know, certain dogs. For example, I've taken more yeah. prong collars off of dogs because they weren't working than I ever put on dogs. Same with e-collars. I've used e-collars and prong collars on a handful of dogs. My dogs, you know, both of my dogs are all three, you know, Dwayne as well, work well on them. I have a problem when people want to ban it across the board. And that's when it becomes a political issue. Right. And that's something that I've seen in, you know, Germany, Switzerland, all these different countries. I just had a person who wrote to me, um, they got a thousand dollars, a thousand euro fine in Switzerland for using a prong collar. And people were in the newspaper screaming that it's not enough. And, you know, it's, it's, it becomes this thing. I think any tool, whether it's food, a leash, your hand, a prong collar, an e-collar, they can all be used in an aversive way. Right. Everyone. Mm -hmm. But to take the tools away, to take them off the table completely, I think is a hindrance to, and again, I'm saying it because of my work in shelters. I've seen thousands of dogs in shelters. I've seen many dogs that, you know, that were at the shelter that the next day I go, they're in a barrel or they're laying dead on the table because nobody wants them, right? So they, and it's not even that. They won't, they don't even want you to pop the leash on the dog. So that's yeah. the hatred that comes in. And my point was always for, for 10 plus years, I said, anytime I'm in the shelter, you can just show up. You only have to call mm -hmm. Just show up. And we've, yeah. like, I, you pick my dog, I pick your dog. You take either an hour or a day or, you know, three days, whatever you know, my, my, my program was, and we'll meet back. And, but nobody ever, those people that criticize on the internet, and it's not like what you said, what you said is you didn't agree with the technique. You might like everything else this trainer does, but you don't agree with that one technique, which is, that's fine. Who cares? If you don't agree with something that I do, you can grow from that or I can grow from that because we can exchange ideas. But to shut it down, I think, is where um, we need to rise above the other people and, you know, and not criticize and not be angry and stuff like that, but just to keep on shining and keep on doing what we're doing. 
Yeah, but this is a very interesting topic. Um, to see how far they took it, which is by banning the tools, by finding people, even putting them in jail, have jail sentences. If you really? if you're getting if you're getting cut and you like keep doing it, okay. yeah, you're you're looking at five years sentence. That is a possibility. Okay, five years in jail and uh, thousands of dollars. Yeah, because oh. you know if you're a recidivist, you know you're going to get more penalties, and at the end oh. they're going to put you away. So, and if that's e color used in some countries, that's what it is. Wow. But always, let's look at it because there's no logic in it, really. If you break it down, there's so many, um, you know, heights in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. But if you break it down, why do people come to this? Because I've, I've, I've come from, you know, police background. Mm -hmm. And as canine handlers, we were also in charge of um, looking into uh, animal abuse, especially dog abuse, right? They call us. Sure. And all those years... And all the people that I've known, you know, quite a few canine handlers across the country, because I met everybody as an instructor. Mm -hmm. And when I asked them, how many files have you gotten? Like how many, uh, and uh, how do you call it? Animal abuse related cases. to e-collar. Yeah, cases do you have? None. Okay, like none, nobody, nobody. Does that mean it doesn't exist? No, but that also means that they do have a lot of cases of animal abuse, dog ab abuse. So what are they related to? Well, they were not related to e-collars. So the 100% of the cases, and there's a lot, were not related to e-collars. So if there, if there's no stats on e-collar abuse, which has any significance, not even the 0 0.1, like literally there is nothing. Right. So why is this a top priority then for politicians? And that's where we go into, okay, well, this is, this is easy bait. If you're a minister of agriculture mm -hmm. and you put out, I mean, this is what's happening right now in Belgium. Are you against animal abuse and you see a dog that's getting, you know, shocked or whatever, which normal human being would say, no, man, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Everybody would go, of course, they're playing on your emotion. Sure. Like, are you going to shock your best friend? Of course not. Right. So it's, it's very, you know, if you go into their thinking process, mm -hmm. they just go, look, we can ban this for you. If you're against this, mm -hmm. just vote. Just vote and we'll get this thing done. We get, we get, we'll deal with this. Mm -hmm. And and these people that vote for this, do you think they think about Robert Cabral and Nino and X Y Z trainers that are so, you know, big about you know helping dogs or making the right, you know, or using the right skills? No, they're thinking broad generalization. Do you want you know people to shock dogs? Nope. Mm -hmm. Can we can we stop it? Yes. Make the vote, and that's mm -hmm. it. So I mean, if you look at the the lobbies that you know they used for you know the the pros and the cons that already tells you who's in these lobbies yeah there, there were people vets that were you know in the anti-lobby for many many years and so okay who's the pro well they didn't invite manufacturers for mm -hmm. sure not so and then there were people's friends they invited who didn't have mm -hmm. you know the right backup the right experience whatever and um, that's how we, you come to these laws and the thing is then you get a domino effect one country yeah. does it Europe, European country, and now, okay, who is it? Switzerland, right? Wait, wait, Switzerland, that belongs to the European Union, but it's mm -hmm. seen as, you know, high development yeah. country. Yeah. So if they do it, hmm, maybe we must look into this. So then somebody else does it, and so on, and, and it brings votes, and it, the people are happy because you mm -hmm. ban a certain tool. Abuse, uh, banning and abuse. It, yeah, exactly. Right. That's what I was, uh, that was I meant. And, and they don't care about the collateral damage, Robert. They don't care. But, but tell me about it, because I don't see it here. I mean, I see fallout. I see, there's a lot of positive-only trainers. I think they're the most vocal group on the internet. And I have no problem with it, because I do 90-plus percent of my training positive-only. You know, and you have your own positive-only course. You'll teach people how to train their dog using only positive methodologies. But how, what kind of fallout are you seeing in Europe from the, the, from the from the lack of the ability to get a, a prong collar or to use a, cor a firm a fair firm correction or to use an e collar, are, are there fallouts? Because people are saying there's no fallouts. Mm -hmm. Can you define fallout? You know, I'm not a native sure. speaker. What, what is fallout, fallout please? Fallout means like negative effect of the ban. For example, are there more dogs right. being given up in animal shelters and stuff like that? Mm. Um. I honestly don't know how big the fallout is because I can only relate to my community mm -hmm. and within the MVP community, the people that I actively coach, there's like a, uh, some people from Europe, we're talking Sweden, um, Switzerland, Germany, 
So and compared to, you know, North America, it's not so much, but the people that I do talk to, it's horrendous. The stories they tell me, I literally, I can't believe it. I'm, I'm totally shocked with what I have to hear. Like sure? how these people, yeah. So uh, there was somebody that said, look, I have to take care of all these dogs. There's aggressive dogs going on. And, um, you know, I, I try to do my job and I try to make sure that everybody's safe. And then I use a, a prong, for example, because they put it all in the same bracket, prong collar, e collar. Sure. She uses it. And then, and then people see her and she gets called out for it. They're going to call the police. They're going to send the police to her. She can't do her job. On the other hand, there's dogs attacking her dog who are totally off leash. That should be all fine. You can't use a crate. All that kind of stuff comes on top of it. She puts the dog in. A, it's like, look, this is insanity. You're trying to do a job. You're 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 serving the community. You're helping people with serious issues. Like you can't let these dogs on the loose. Even mm -hmm. the person that does my positive only program, uh, I mean, we both in it. But she like she is the one. Like she holds all the the keys, the secrets to it. Uh, I mean, she's a pro. She uses tools also. I mean, sure. you can't just go out there and say, look, you know, I'm gonna put my knock myself on the chest and I'm gonna do it all. Uh, that that's that's crazy. But the way these people are now shoved into like almost criminals in the criminal corner and you know that's just wrong it's and these have these people have generally good intentions and if you have good intentions why are we getting pursued almost by a government that you know does nothing to look at this problem from the bigger picture look like yeah. why are you gonna hide there's huge problems with dogs there's bite incidents more than ever there's crazy aggressive dogs that nobody needs a license to buy a dog nobody's gonna ask you hey robert you qualify to buy xyz dog with you know that weighs 90 pounds with jaws like this nobody's gonna ask you yeah. it's just you can you can but oh if you want to use something like you know to to navigate through this you know process of of having a dog of this size or or with these issues they're yeah. coming after you. That's just wrong. Yeah. And, and I, if I look at this country, Belgium, the, the home of the Belgian Malinois, right? Yeah. This is where it all started. Mm -hmm. And our minister says, hey, um, look at this. Malinois um, intercepted uh, Al-Qaeda number two, right? They, uh, there was a Belgian Malinois. That was not yeah. so long ago. I think it was about two years ago. Yeah. And then six weeks later, the other minister of the same party says, yep, it's the rap people. We're going to ban the e collar uh, let me ask the first minister, how do you think that dog was trained? You thought, it, you think it was just, you know, it came out of a litter and that's what he did is apprehend terrorists. No, it, it was trained with an e-collar. Okay. So, you know, if you're going to make a judgment on collars, then don't brag about these great dogs we have from special forces that are trained with an e-collar. Mm -hmm. And this kind of hypocrisy is very disturbing to me. Uh, but it goes way further than this. If you really read on what they've designed, it, it's like, okay, here in Belgium, specifically, they say we're going to ban all e-collar use operated by men, people. Mm -hmm. But we do allow electric fencing. Bark Wait a second here. Too? Yeah, so uh, bark collars, I have to look into this. I, I'm not sure, 100% sure. I do know they make a distinction between, okay, human operation, none. Uh -huh. Invisible fencing, yes. Wait a second here. Dog gets... You know, an e-collar around his neck, invisible <laughs> fencing. Yes. Right. Who's going to put this fence in the ground? People? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> who's Yeah. Who's who's going to ensure that this dog understands what this fence is going to do? People? Yes. Yeah. But you can't operate. Okay. Now you can use a collar around the dog's neck. So the post is smarter than the human, supposedly. And and now, wait, what, what is this? Like, they can't even come up with like, all right. It, it's no, no, they have to make this little exception, but don't you try to use it, even if you're competent or not, we don't care, but the post is competent. And then the statement was, because of course, people started questioning this and they asked like, why this and not that? Well, they said, the dog has a choice with the invisible fence. He could choose <laughs> not to cross the fence. Look, last time I checked, that is the whole purpose of training dogs, that right. you have them understand their choices and they right. can make a good or right one. Yeah. So that went so against the philosophy of a, a good dog trainer that you go, what? Why are we being like uh, belittled by our government? Why are they feeding us? Why are they treating us like idiots? Yeah. Like, don't you do this? You're too dumb. You can't use yeah. it. But the fence, the post in the ground, they will yeah. fix it for you. Well, what is that? Where does that come from? Why yeah. do we have to 2022 where the internet, you can find anything, any mm -hmm. expertise. You could be a scholar from the internet. You could be, <laughs> you could be anything, anything you imagine to be, 
you you have online classes. I have online classes. There's information all over the place. Yeah. Yet government has to tell you, don't you do that because yeah. that is dangerous. That what are you talking about? Yeah. Look, you're just but, gonna hide from all these. But it's brought yeah, it's, about by you know. And I always think that the people, the positive only people, um, is the extremist. I think they come from a place like they don't want to see a dog get hurt, right? They don't want to see a dog get shocked. I mean, look, I'm the first person who tell you I've been to plenty mm -hmm. of IGP clubs, ring clubs, and you know, obedience clubs. And I mean, I remember an AKC club, this woman was frying this little Aussie, frying the dog, you know, and it was wrong. But that doesn't mean the tool should be taken away from a responsible person, right? I mean, here, my argument is always, we have abuse laws. I'm sure Belgium has very strict abuse laws. We have mm -hmm. very strict abuse laws. If you abuse a dog, you must pay the price, right? But that abuse shouldn't be dictated by the tool you're using. In other words, if you're abusing a dog on an e-collar and just frying and frying mm -hmm. and frying, you're wrong. You should be fined or have the, you know, or whatever, be put in jail or whatever. But there's no limit to that like if you have the dog okay let's say you have to use a flat collar and a six foot leash and then okay then you kick the dog right you don't have the e-collar you don't have the prong collar now you're just kicking the dog and i saw a a, a, a trainer uh, he was a very very competent trainer who went positive only and he couldn't get his dog to to to, to search on a track he said such 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 and the third time he just kicked the dog in the rear end all the way down the track the first leg of the track and I thought that was more abusive than, you know, either frontlining the dog or pronging or stimming the dog on an e-collar to get the dog to do it, if that was the case. I mean, first of all, on, on, on tracking, you wouldn't use that. But the, the idea of kicking a dog with your feet is emotionally more abusive to the dog than receiving a stim on an e-collar, which is once removed from the person. Yeah, well, you, may, you, you make sense. You're, a, you're an expert. You're a professional. Oh. I mean, there's nobody that could debate this with common sense that has mm -hmm. trained dogs like this. Because that's the thing, the people calling, hey, ban this, do this. Have you ever trained a special forces dog? Have you ever trained high level dogs, high drive dogs? Have you ever trained muscular? Have you ever trained a very tiny dog and also using or implementing an e collar where you had, you know, unbelievable results because of your sophisticated touch, because of your skill, because of your, you know, uh, an an analysis on how to, you know, approach this. And, mm -hmm. and normally people that do, you know, uh, I mean, people that have, that are very efficient because of the skills that they use. And then the tools becomes, you know, the, the oh, but they did it with an e-collar. Okay, so that makes them an idiot now? <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's right. also one of those things. Okay, oh, you did it with an e-collar. Um, yeah, Doesn't so? Count. what the, Doesn't count. Yeah, am I not competent now? I'm not competent because I did it with an e-collar. Okay, I get it. So it's the e-collar that trains the dog. It's, yeah. it's also one of those biased things. Uh, but you see, nobody cares about it, Robert. Mm -hmm. They want they want to get rid of it because they believe if the majority is too stupid, and they, and that's what the statement they're making. You're all too stupid, guys. Even if you educate yourselves, you're still too stupid. Mm -hmm. We're gonna ban it because you can't even buy it. If they would say qualify, show us some skills, show us some proof, mm -hmm. it would make start making more sense because everybody's you know for having skills in order to use something complex as an e-collar maybe. Yeah. Uh, but there's no such thing because that would take a uh, regulation that would take people to to see if these are being followed up it would mm -hmm. take administration so now we're talking resources money they're like hey might as well ban it get get, it, get yeah. even more votes yeah, yeah. so why yeah. bother look we're we're like we're having a debate here but there's nobody to talk against yeah. who is a who has a shot caller in this industry to maybe change it mm -hmm. uh, that's the thing and you can't reach him even yeah, even you... if you have a lot of online presence, if you're renowned, mm -hmm. no nobody asked me in Belgium. I have uh, federal instructor certificates. Mm -hmm. You know, I have been traveling the whole world doing e collar universities before. You know, I am an expert in the field because I use it. I have trained police officers. I have you know gone to Australia, even trained special forces, the SAS, mm -hmm. talking about e collars and all that kind of stuff. You would believe they would somehow maybe ask an expert that has done this. Yeah. They've never did. They never yeah. did. Right. So, I and, my, and when I, yeah, and I, I don't even know what expert did they get on board to see, okay, then if somebody's against it, then who can give us some other Before thinking it. processes? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't know anything about it. Look, they just yeah. handled their business in, in some dark room, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, there's already, maybe they already yeah. made up their mind. It was yeah. just a facade, I don't know.
Well, you did a debate. But, I'm not going to mention the names, but I watched the debate that you did with a, with a person who, was, who claimed to be positive only. And you had incredibly good um, debate skills with this person. And your point was, to, if two normal people, like not even dog trainers, just two average people watched the debate, they would see one, your, and I'm sure they can search it, your candor, your um, professionalism, and your knowledge on the topic of using an e-collar. And this other person against it couldn't really argue against And I was looking at it very optimistically. I mean, you and I had just met. Uh, my wife, Jana, told me to, to watch this debate, which you told me to watch a, a while ago that you did. And then I finally watched it, and I gained a new respect for you because you did handle it well. You, you made your point very well, and you, and you, you enunciated on your positions very clearly. Um, but this person, you know, kind of sat with their arms crossed, and they were very, you know. And I, that's kind of sadly what I find in the whole movement. In other words, there shouldn't be a question that abuse is abuse and we should all come together against abuse, right? And now many won't because even though they're positive, they will still use a form of abuse, whether it's withholding food or, you know, or, or po poking the dog or doing other things. But it's not the tool that's evil. It's the mind that's pushing the button, pulling the line or whatever it is that's evil. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, choking a dog. You, you can have a dog on a flat buckle collar and choke him off or choke him out. Right. But and that, you know, maybe the laws should be pertaining to the methodology of abuse as opposed to the utilization of a particular tool. Yes. But going back to that specific situation, like if you have to go into a debate and she, she voluntarily went into the debate. So props for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants to do it because it, it always turns into a shit show. Mm -hmm. So you can't change your mind halfway. So whatever I say, even if it makes sense, even mm. if you give le yeah. legit examples, even if you if you try to find a middle ground, you can't because you, you are against it. You can't change your mind. It's like talking to a vet. And my experience is she came here, the professor, you know, published a lot of things in Europe, anti-e-collar. We had a debate here with the professor that helped me create the MVP. And it was a very nice conversation. I mean, there was no heat, but she said, look, guys, she said, I love what you do. That all the talent assessments, you know, how we start looking at dog training. She was really excited about it genuinely, but she said, I can never help you guys because you are associated with e-collars. We almost fell off, off our chairs, especially yeah. the professor. He said, what do you mean, professor? I said, what, were we bad people now? She says, <laughs> I've been doing publications. Like I can't like come to you. If you have on your website dogs with a collar on, or even you educate a body collars, that's a no go. Wow. And that told me, look, if a smart person like that, mm -hmm. this is a generally smart person, says, even if I agree with you guys, even if I want to back up this whole story, I can't because I chose to be in the anti lobby, that says it all. Yeah. Right. So, so we could bring out, which we did. See, we said, can we bring out our dogs? Can we show what we do? Can we? Everything was all in vain. She was never going to stand up and help us in our other process. We wanted sure, to get, yeah. uh, you know, some sort of validation from scientific standpoint on the talent assessments and stuff. But it, it was, it was, it went into a debate about e collar, mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't supposed to be about an e collar. But we went to it of because of the I am against, I am before, I am now in this chair, and I have mm -hmm. to be against. Mm -hmm. So it's, it doesn't matter what you say. You yeah. can make sense, Robert. You make sense the whole time. I generally feel that I, I listen to your uh, lecture also. You're a good speaker. You make a lot of sense in the stuff you do. You say it's built on expertise. It's built on, on true results. But you can go out and, and be a you know member of the lobby then where you have to speak before you think they're going to worry or care about what you say. Oh, you helped yeah. thousands of dogs from the shelter with that tool. Good for you. We're still going to stop it. You see, it's, mm -hmm. it's inevitable. It's unstoppable. Mm -hmm. There's no common sense anymore. Try not to find it. It's going to frustrate you. Yeah, I fought I against you. the the biased uh, anti e collar within the police in the early years. Now they all use it. They all use mm -hmm. it. It's an, even part of the the, the whole training. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember the day when I was, you know, doing you know the first steps to. I was uh, the 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 amount of hate I got from my own colleagues was. I said sometimes you got to think: Is this battle? What is mm -hmm. it? This pure madness. It's it's it not is, yeah. based on common sense. 
And it's going to come to the U.S. It's inevitable it's, also. It's because coming. They're, they're taking it. They're yeah. trying to get it into territories. You know, certain territories, like New York has a thing on the agenda. The, the, here's yep. the problem with it, Nino, is I, I think when you take that tool away and you make it illegal, people will still use it, but they'll use it in a more negative way. You know, it'll, it won't be on the surface. You won't be in the public with your e-call. You're going to be behind a fence somewhere. You're going to be in a barn somewhere you know, burning the dog, doing what you can do, and then you're going to come out and go, okay, let's try again. You know, and that's mm -hmm. where really, when you take it out of the public, when you shame it, when you, when you don't allow people to be open and, and, and experiment and learn and educate themselves and, and, and be proactive mm -hmm. about it, then you're going to move it into the back alleys. And when you do, you know, like drugs, like prostitution, like any other thing, once it becomes taboo, it doesn't mm -hmm. really help the, the the intended victim, right? In other words, it doesn't help the dogs because, okay, so we can't train the dog with the e-collar. People say, well, if you can't train the dog, this is one of my pet peeves, and I think I talked about it at IACP. I said, people always will come to me and I say, well, if you're such a good trainer, train the dog without the e-collar. And then I say back, if you're such a good trainer, do it without the cookie, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't train dogs with e-collars. Yeah. I use e-collars, I layer them in later. I use treats, I use motivation, I use energy, I use a dynamic relationship very much, you know, you and I are very much on the same page as that, but um, taking away a tool that I might need later or may not need later, you know, that's where you're going to hinder the, the, the thing. And it's not about the electricity because electricity, you know, we use a TENS unit, we use, um, a, a, we use our phones, we use, you know, we use other things that require electricity. Mm -hmm. It's just we're, we're, we're labeling one tool as being bad, you know, and, and I, think that, I think another problem will be is saying, well, you have to be certified to use it. That's the next step that they're saying is, well, you'll have to have a certification, but then who's going to be the person who's going to certify those people? What are the, it's not going to be you and me, right? It's not going to be somebody who's really qualified to teach, you know, e-collar or certify people on e-collar. Well, that you don't know, but I would say if yes. that debate ever comes up, I would definitely, you know, maybe take that route towards finding the middle ground because maybe. we're going to lose. We're going to yeah. lose because in the U.S. dog industry, I mean, the pet industry is a 65 billion industry. Mm -hmm. You think anybody cares about the numbers on e-collar no. sales? <laughs> no. Ridiculous. Look, it's, it's not even a fraction. Minimal, minimal. The impact will be so minimal majority doesn't use it majority doesn't need it right because they don't they're not even exposed sure. to it of course in the u.s you have a lot of professionals so you have a bigger chance if you all you know start to team up that your lobby will become bigger either in europe it's non-existent there was no lobby of professionals that's marginal mm -hmm. so we had no chance we were already you know we were done before we started mm -hmm. and i am the collateral damage of 0.01 percent nobody cares Mm -hmm. But I started, I stopped caring as well, because if you care about things that you can't change, you, you'll get frustrated. And and that's I not what I, what I want either. So it, it's become this thing where you, when I have this conversation with you, I'm like, oh, of course, there's still people with common sense. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, we step outside the door and I even <laughs> have to tell my own mom why I would use a tool like that because she doesn't right. even understand. And that's totally fine because she's right. not into this business. She doesn't and train she dogs professionally. To, yeah. She, yeah, and she doesn't know working dogs' abilities and, and all the kind of problem solving. It, it's not a problem. But if uh, anyone would ask her, would you agree uh, with shocking dogs? You'd say no. Well, neither would even you. Even if it was... She, yeah, but that's the thing. That's how <laughs> right. it's, uh, you know, that's it's how the cam campaigns are. Yes. Yeah. And people are and voting the, on a topic they know nothing them. about, right? And I think that's oftentimes the, the, the situation. People are voting on, you're not a dog trainer, she's not a dog trainer, but you get a vote just like I get a vote on a topic. But I'll, I'll tell you what, yeah. I, what I think is important, you know, and I was talking, this is kind of, I was talking to a couple of guys online, a couple of the bigger trainers online. Um, here's my goal. I'm going to put it out there to you and I'm going to put it out there to these other people. We have a large audience. We have a large reach, right? We're very well-liked people. I mean, maybe you're probably more liked than me, but I think <laughs> I know about you're, that. You're nice. <laughs> but here's the thing. I think by putting content out there, by putting dog training videos, like you put out there, the, the fun stuff on Instagram and, you know, and all the good stuff, like, you know, showing that 
and showing that a lot of these results are attained by using a balanced training method, which might mean a slip lead, it might mean a prong collar, it might mean an e-collar, and putting more and more of this out there. Because when I look at, for the most part, the people who are criticizing me, I mean, there's one, one or two people who just barrage me. They just take my videos off of YouTube, download them, and then narrate everything over it. And one of them is this huge Akita, 100-pound Akita, who tried to bite his owner, tried to bite every other dog around. And we used a prong collar and an e-collar, and now the dog Perfect. Dog can be around other dogs. dogs. Dog's fine. They never look at the end result. They look at the process and say, see, he's doing this, and this is why the dog is like that, and he's doing this, and this is why the dog's like that. But yet these people have never attained a result. Maybe they went to, a, you know, one of these people went to a, a school, you know, one of the local schools. I'm not going to mention the name. Um, and now they're, they have maybe one or two videos of them training a dog, but they have eight videos of them criticizing everyone from me to, and I'm not going to say the other people's names, um, but that's the, the brunt of their work is criticizing. So perhaps if people like you and I and, and some of these other well-established trainers online can just band together and put good content out there and be open and be vocal about, yeah, we need these tools that maybe there's some hope for somewhere, whether it's maybe something can come around in Europe, maybe it can prevent it in other countries, um, where we have that voice, right? We have that platform where we can show people. The thing is, Robert, here's where I see the first problem coming in, is that label, people love to label people, and they will tell you, e-collar trainer, e-collar trainer, e-collar trainer, and you could say, so what? Yes, that's that's totally fine. But at some point, it does start to hurt you because e-collar training to the broad audience is seen as people that lack skill, that needed to control their dog. So there's a negative undertone. So if you're a social, if you keep saying about the e-collar, you become this face of the e-collar. Now you become the face of evil. Now you get exposed exposed to even more hate. And at some point, you know, you have to look at, okay, what's the gain here? Because, I mean, what you're doing is in the common interest of everyone. And I see that's a very, very genuine thing to do. It's a very nice thing to do, you know, for the community. But what has the community given you? Mm -hmm. Seriously, well, I mean, what has the community? Yeah. Well, well I mean, I mean it has given me something. I mean, it has given me, a, a, I make a very good living. I have a good position. I love my job and I, I follow my passion. But but just to, just to correct one thing. I don't, I'm not saying we should be e-collar trainers. I don't think I'm labeled or you're labeled as an e-collar trainer, but I think just speaking out and saying that there, that the tool should be available. I may or may not use it, but it's not, you know, you and I know trainers who that's all they do. That's just everything is e-collar, 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 e-collar. And I know pet dog trainers. They get a client in, first thing, an e-collar goes on the dog and everything is trained to the e-collar and then the client gets the e-collar and that. I think there's a place for it. Right. There's certain things that I can do with an e-collar that mm -hmm. I really can't do without it. A, a great example. And we, we, I know we got to wrap this up because you and I could talk forever and I, we should have many more chats <laughs> like this. I think people will really enjoy it. I'll give you an example. I talked to somebody. I'm not mentioning any names. This person's a trainer for for hunting. And I said to him, I said, you know, because at first my wife didn't want to use the e-collar on the dog to get the dog to bring the duck back. And I said, please, let's do this because we can fix this. And these suggestions came out from these other people with everything from, well, you'll hide in the bushes. And when the dog doesn't come back, you come out with a stick and you start chasing the dog, beating the stick on the ground. And I thought, that's about the most emotionally, mentally abusive thing I think you could possibly do to a dog. Why not let him run away, bump him on the e-collar. When he turns back to you, inspire, motivate him to come back and abundantly reward him when he gets back. He's going to figure out his one movement created a negative circumstance, which was immediately fixed by turning back, and the problem was solved. And thank God my wife, you know, did say, you know, let's give it a try. And we did, and literally in an afternoon, the dog understood it. And, you know, and then people said to me, well, okay, but what are you going to do when the e-collar is not on? But that is an idiotic argument, because what are you going to do when you don't have a cookie or a clicker or whatever? You don't have the reinforcer, whether it's a negative or positive reinforcer for scientific people, but you form the behavior. The behavior is formed. So my point is, maybe I use an e-collar on, I don't know, 5% of the dogs I train, if that. Mm -hmm. 
But I'm going to say, hey, I think it's a valuable tool. I, I don't think we should ban it. And again, with your audience, my audience, uh, these other people's audience who, who, who we all know, maybe it's a platform that people will say, well, you know, Robert's not against it. Mino's not against it. You know, this guy's not against it. That guy's not against it. But the people who are against it, let's look at their following. Let's look at who they are. Let's look at the results they're producing. It's my, it's look, honestly, you know, it's my, it's a dream that people in politics would actually say, well, let's, let's look at it quantitatively. Let's, let's, let's really evaluate who's for it and who's mm -hmm. against it. What results are they getting and what results are these people getting? I don't know. I'm, I'm processing everything you're saying. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, this is something okay. that you really have to think about. You make mm -hmm. good points, good arguments. Um, I was just thinking back at something you, you just mentioned. Right. When you talked about the hunting story, mm -hmm. the new debate that's coming now is not anymore because this makes so much sense what you say. It's almost a no-brainer than if you would have a debate with somebody and you say, well, you're going to chase dog with a stick and, and whatever. He's in, he's in this catch. He needs to do this stuff with the hunting. That's what he's built for its purpose. They'll come at you and say, who says he needs to hunt then? Absolutely. That's the next question. Thousand percent. And, and the same thing with protection or obedience. Why does the yeah. dog have to walk with his head up? Why yeah. does he have to do a go? Why should he go out to the end yeah. of the field? Why? They yeah. want couch because, potato dogs. Well, that's a, it would just shift the whole problem to, you know, non-existent. Like you don't need any color because your dog doesn't need to chase this rabbit or need to doesn't need to retrieve it you can just pick it up yourself <laughs> or uh yeah. <laughs> no I, I mean that's just one of those things and or only use dogs that don't need it then if your dog is is willing right. to then well then i guess the dog's not fit right yep so you get, get this um yeah it same goes for protection works you know now yep. they've been sending uh, dogs from germany back to holland because they mm -hmm. can't use collars and they can't control them they can't have them to add because they were used to you know, a high drive using stem, and then mm -hmm. the dog can't just overnight become a positive only trained dog. And I see all this right. stuff, but you know what they do? Just send them back now. Yep. Could and be the, think, could be a great police dog, but they just right. here have it back. And that's that. It, the, it, you know, in coming full circle in our conversation, this is this is the collateral damage, right? What what's going to happen to those yep. dogs? They're either going to be put down, they're going to be put in you know in some kind of a shelter or some kind of a you know a home. Uh, you know, uh, sanctuary where they'll never experience life. They'll, they'll be, you know, they'll just be shut down till the day they die and they might as well just drown them when they're born. You know, I mean, it's, it's very, very sad. You know, years ago, that's what people did. If the dog came out, they were too aggressive. They just drowned them. You know, that, that was yep. very well. People don't talk about it now anymore, but now they're letting, you know, every dog comes. Oh, if, even if it's sick, oh, it's got three legs. That's okay. Let's get it through anyway. You know, those are the dogs that were either put in a freezer or put in a bucket. And that was the end of them. But if we're going to be really humane to dogs, then we need to be humane all the way around. We can't just be humane part of the way. And this might, you know, like I said, this is my dream. I mean, again, I'm kind of semi-retired from, you know, from really working that much now. Um, but I hope to inspire other people, which is why I went to ISCP, to carry on this fight for the good of the dog, really. And when you, I see the dogs you work with and the dogs that I work with in the shelter, you know, they deserve a chance. You know, they don't deserve two or three chances. If they bite somebody in the face or they kill a child, I think they should be killed. That's my point. But I do think they deserve a chance. Let's see. Let's give them that shot, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, what I meant earlier with, you know, if, if Robert becomes the face of the community, which you then are, you're like on the barricade, you're a forerunner, you, you're lead by, you know, helping other trainers to come on the same platform and share this uh, concern, legitimate concern. But that's when uh, what I mentioned is uh, how can you ensure the community is not going to turn against you and then diminish all the work, the good work you've done, because they will see you as the root of evil, because you mm -hmm. said they're, they scream the hardest, there is more, way more people. And, and how is Robert going to win? Uh, like the five percenters, that, you know, let's make it even 10. So many people against the, the common, you know, uh, thought of e call users, even in my close proximity, is like some of them. Oh, you, you, oh, that's right. You, do you use it? We don't really know anymore because mm -hmm. you know we don't talk about what I do every day. 
It's like, oh, right. Yeah, because they were actually against it. This is now you're against your brother. You're against your, well, no, but you know, right? Because we know you're, you're doing good things with dogs. You see, so it's so deep embedded, that process of, I mean, that concern of people, shocking. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to find, you know, reasoning. And all, all the stuff you said here tonight uh, was was on point. I mean, it's undebatable. Of course, you're going to need it for these shelter dogs. They need new futures. They need new, I mean, anything you can use that involves skill and your talents and why not? Mm -hmm. But I think we're so far off from common sense, like the yeah. debate that I had. It's like, I've generally felt this is a smart lady. She knows mm -hmm. exactly what it's about. And yet she could not agree because she was not supposed to agree. And I think mm -hmm. this uh, cognitive dissonance almost mm -hmm. is leading to a, where there's no outcome. There's only yeah. losers here. Mm -hmm. And Switzerland, Germany, uh, Belgium now, Holland, like all, all these countries, can you believe it? Belgium and Holland, like both banning tools. This is where it all started, guys. You love you love those dogs in the U.S. that you use in special forces and operations and canine handlers, saving people, you know, detecting explosives, whatever, camera dogs. What do you think? I know special forces people. I talk to them. I, I know, I, I mean, there's people I always brag about it, but I actually know them. They have a yeah. dog off of me. Yeah. Hey, guys, what, I said, what are you going to do when, you know, the ban is installed? Yeah. They said, well, well, we can't train a camera dog without the tool. Right. Well, yeah. Are you going to train a camera dog with such an important task, mm -hmm. and you can't? You got to go with luck. Maybe, yeah. maybe he'll. <laughs> that's the thing, and that's what I mean. Like, there's purpose, and and why does everything have to? Let's say the caller adds at some point some stress. Look, in these situations, mm -hmm. the stress is still better than being killed. Mm -hmm. Why is it such a big deal? I I have stress every day as a every human day. being. Nobody cares. You have stress. Yeah. Everybody has stress. Sure. Oh, but the dog has now stress for five yeah. seconds in its 24-hour day. Ooh, yeah. big yeah. problem. Yeah. Well, they've proven, I mean, again, we can wrap it up on this, but you know, the, the, there's been proof that a dog, you know, you a remote collar, the stimulation <coughs> used in a remote collar created a level of stress, but the owner or the handler yelling at the dog created more a higher level of stress and that can be proven scientifically can be proven if, if they ever want to get down to that but I, again i don't i think you said the right thing they don't want to prove it scientifically they just want to sweep it under the rug and pass the law and get more votes yeah yeah that's that's why i'm sorry i have to start you know close the debate with i'm a little bit skeptic in the chances we got but you're right i mean completely given up would definitely not be an option yeah. But, you know, I'm not new to this anymore. I've been in this for almost 20 years and I've seen it like from being very uh, controversial to accepted, mm -hmm. accepted and now going back to now banned, just government yeah. banned. I'm, I'm seeing like, look, where's the end of the tunnel here? And yeah. you guys in the U.S. will probably, it, it won't be this year or next year, maybe in the coming decade, whatever, it's going to happen, I think at some point. But, you know, just like, you know, in the U.S. as, as more, I mean, there's there's stronger lobbies, I believe, than in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, we hope so. You might you might you know be good for a while, but yeah. in the end, the perception. Look, if I hear this is maybe also interesting, as I had a phone call with somebody from the Emirates, Dubai, they were talking about a ban in the Middle East as well, like a country like uh, the Emirates, wow. which surprised me because yeah, me their too. animal laws are not as like Western countries. Yeah, not at all. So. If, if that's on the table in, in like the Middle East, yeah. well, that tells you it's it's going to spread. It's yeah. going to spread. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I All think right. it's a, you know, we've, we've discussed everything we need to say about this. So yeah, I agree. All right. Well, listen, I want, well, let's do this again. Uh, this was really fun. I think people, I'll put a link down to your site, your courses and all your uh, social media in the video down below. I hope people will find you and, discover you and, and if they don't already know you, I'm sure, I mean, so many people already know you. Um, I just thought it was not necessarily to point you out to more people, because I think, again, so many people know you, but to really get to know you as a person, which is very fascinating, something you don't really get to see online, is, I, is I'm always intrigued by the personalities of people who do what they do. That's always a passion of mine. So um, this was a really fun chat, and I think it brought to video what you and I, the, the connection you and I shared when we met in Florida. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you for this invitation. And if if you're okay with it, I'd also like to invite, invite you on my platform. 
It's really interesting stuff you mentioned. We, you know, my audience is a lot about, you know, performance and dogs. And and I, I think it would be good to also hear somebody like you who is, you know, very well spoken, who uh, has a ton of experience. You also trained Malinois, working dogs, any type of dog. So I'd be excited to have you on my podcast also if you're willing to. Anytime. You just tell me when I'll be there.